Hello everyone, I am Dr. Talha bin Said. I am second year resident of internal medicine, Faisalabad Medical University Allied Hospital, Faisalabad. It's been a great pleasure for me to be the part of this global summit called SciTech Central Conference 2021. In this COVID-19 pandemic, we are coming across a number of COVID-19 patients which are being complicated by co-infections and super-infections. And yes, I'm here to present my case today, a COVID-19 patient who was complicated by pulmonary aspergillosis. So here, let's start our case. A 57-year-old patient, if the heart presents with fever, cough, malaise for five days, and shortness of breath for three days. The fever was low grade, intermittent, and acute in onset. The cough is dry with no associated chest pain. He also complained for malaise, that is tiredness, decreased appetite, and flu-like illness. These symptoms all together followed by shortness of breath on exertion. Two weeks ago, he attended bar elections. After arrival at home, he felt completely fine. So here are the risk factors for COVID-19 disease he had. First of all, his advancing age, that is 57 years, and his gender, which is male. He had exposure two weeks back at bar elections, then that was preceded by fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath on exertion, respectively. In his past medical history, he was hypertensive. But that was fairly controlled with losartan, that is angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist. In his social history, he was advocate at high court and father of two adult children. There was no traveling history except that exposure at bar gatherings, which he had. In his family history, his family history was positive for hypertension, coronary artery diseases, and diabetes mellitus. On physical examination, he had tachycardia with pulse 110 beats per minute and he was fairly febrile with 100.2 Fahrenheit temperature and the respiratory rate was 20 breaths per minute. His oxygen saturation at room air was 82%. On auscultation of the chest, there were diffused fine crackles with fair air entry and the increased work of breathing. Rest of the systemic examinations were quite normal. So what are our differentials? First of all, COVID-19 on the top. As every respiratory tract infection in the pandemic should be considered as COVID until proven otherwise. Second, we have bacterial pneumonias as atypical agents might present in the same way, likely mycoplasma pneumonia, chlamydia pneumonia, and legionella. Thirdly, we have influenza, parainfluenza, and common cold as flu-like illness, fever, myalgias, arthalgias, and bellies point towards these illnesses. Meanwhile, we considered sending nasopharyngeal swab for COVID-19 of the patient and that came out positive. Imaging was done immediately in which chest x-ray that showed bilateral peripheral consolidations that is very typical for COVID with no blunting of costopharynic angles. On HRCT chest, there were down glass opacities and up to 80% lungs involvement. His baselines were sent. His baselines were sent in which white blood cell count was mildly raised with profound lymphopenia that is again typical for COVID and his amino transferases were also released. His severity markers were also markedly raised, especially ferroserum ferritin, D-dimers, which was quite high, and LDH. CRP was quite within the normal range. Our main stay of treatment was steroids, that is methyl prednisolone. And for anticoagulation, we use heparin, and then for broad spectrum antibiotics, we had meropenem and moxifloxacin. Fulfilling the criteria for tocilizumab, three doses were also given, and the rest of the treatment remained symptomatic. Here are the trends in his complete blood count with wide blood cells, has an increasing trend 
along with the urea and creatinine which were also rising day by day. Here you can see the trends in his severity markers with his CRP has a rising trend which is rising day by day. With effective oxygen therapy, strong antibiotics, cupping and proning, steroids and anticoagulants, my patient improved until day 16. When he started to cough again, he started to feel short of breath again and his oxygen demands began to rise again. At this point, we sent all of his baselines and we investigated him for his sputum analysis. Sputum for culture, sensitivity and for fungal growth was sent. That came out positive for Aspergillus fumigatus. So we diagnosed so we diagnosed the case as COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis, also known as Kappa. In a study, it was found that those patients with community acquired co infections and hospital acquired super infections had worse outcomes. In another study that was held from January to August 2020, the rate was co infections was 10% in hospitalized patients with COVID 19 and the rate was 18% in those COVID-19 patients who are admitted in ICUs. So this is how COVID-19 is being complicated by co-infections and super-infections. That raises our main concerns. As you all know, back in 1918, influenza pandemic was also associated with pulmonary aspergillosis, but the frequency of Kappa this is 35 to 38% of all ICU patients with COVID-19 as compared to the frequency of IPA that was 16 to 23% back in 1918. So what are the risk factors for development of aspergillosis? First of all, these are the ones in immunocompromised people and the blue ones are the ones in immunocompetent people. So in immunocompromise, you can see the profound neutropenia, glucocorticoid juice, coronary granulomatous diseases, advanced HIV infections, relapsed leukemia, severe liver diseases, and high levels of stored iron in bone marrow. So what happens in immunocompetent people like one happened in my patient? First of all, having prior pulmonary disease like pneumonia, it can be viral, it can be bacterial or COPD. Then immunomodulating modulating agents such as infliximab or ibrutinib. Then immunocompetent people, what happens is that the temporary abrogation of protective responses as a result of glucocorticoid juice or a general anti-inflammatory state can cause development of aspergillosis. Here you can see the structural damage by SARS-CoV-2 infection itself plus the impaired immune system. They provide a very good base, very good ground for the development of Spergillus conidia to colonize. They colonize over there, they germinate and they cause direct tissue invasion. The tissue invasion caused by this conidia plus the cytokine storm itself. They damage the lung parenchyma badly and progress to the development of COVID associated pulmonary aspergillosis. So here are the salient features of aspergillosis. More than 80% of the cases involve the nasty. Then the patient presents with fever, although the fever often responds to leukocorticoids. But it does not mean that the disease has subsided. In fact, the disease progresses. That is followed by a cough that is sometimes productive. Chest discomfort, hemoptysis, and shortness of breath. All these symptoms all together would lead to respiratory and multi-organ failure. In majority of the cases, the diagnosis of Kappa was established when the respiratory status continued to worse or the rising fever or the persistent fever prompt further workup. In some cases, the, both the conditions lead to the diagnosis of Kappa. Here are the different diagnostic modalities. First of all, sputum culture remains on the top. 
Then come the tracheal aspirate, bronchial brush or bronchial alveolar lavage in the intubated patients in ICUs. Then comes the PCR. Then comes the galactomarin testing, a molecule released from the aspergillus organism during growth. That test is quite expensive and is not readily available. Then comes a histopathologic examination of lung tissues upon biopsy, autopsy. The base of progression of kappa leaves a narrow clinical window for making its diagnosis in time without losing the patient. So we need a strong correlation between clinical symptoms of the patient, radiographic findings and the laboratory data to make the diagnosis of kappa in time so that we do not lose our patient. So this is the hello sign seen in HRCT of some of the patients with kappa. So when present in early course of infection, it is a good prognostic feature. So basically it's a localized down loss appearance and it represents an hemorrhagic infarction which is surrounding a nodule or consolidation inside. So in the treatment we have first line agents, those are bodigonazole and isoboconazole. So the oral dose is usually 200 mg BD for voriconazole and the IV loading dose for voriconazole is in adults it's 6 mg per kg twice at 12 hour intervals that is followed by 4 mg per kg every 12 hour only. Before our patient, I put my patient on voriconazole 200 mg BD but unfortunately he could not make it he died on the fourth day after the diagnosis of kappa. So the duration of therapy is three months to several years, depending on the patient's immune status and response to therapy. Relapse usually occurs if the response is suboptimal and that the immune deconstitution is not complete. The mortality rate of invasive aspergillosis is 30 to 70 percent if the infection is treated. But if the infection is missed, the diagnosis is missed, the mortality rate is 100%. Which led me to the conclusion that association of aspergillosis and COVID-19 raises the strong need for screening of fungal infections in severe COVID-19 patients and those with certain risk factors. Thank you for your patient listening.